I've had people call me and say, my son lost his father and he's watched this movie every day for three months because he's, it's helping him process. But like, what else as a writer, as an artist, could you ever want? The only way you get there is you push into your own lava. If you really are pushing into your most vulnerable self, it will reverberate. You, you're the brave one who does that first and then everybody else can therefore benefit from it. Welcome to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies. Each episode, we speak to a brilliant screenwriter who's kindly dug out their initial screenplay for what became a beloved movie, discussing what changed, what didn't, and why, from first draft to the big screen. It's been an emotional start to the year, so we're kicking 2021 off with the ultimate emotional journey of a movie. Having sent audiences into the cosmos with Wally and into the clouds with Up, Animation giant Pixar went for a more introspective approach in 2015 with Inside Out, a heartwarming story set entirely in the mind of an adolescent girl. Riley is 11 when her family relocates to San Francisco, forcing her to leave behind her friends and classmates in Minnesota. Inside Riley's head as she attempts to get to grips with this daunting new life of hers are five emotions, joy, sadness, disgust, fear and anger. When Catastrophe Strikes, Joy, voiced by Amy Poehler, is sent on a mission across Riley's mind with sadness. Along the way, she learns that sorrow isn't something to be stamped out or fixed. It's an emotion to be embraced. Our guest this week, the fantastic Meg LaFauve, co-wrote the film with Josh Cooley and director Pete Docter, who came up with the idea for Inside Out after observing his own daughter's changing emotions as she dealt with adolescence. It was a hard story to crack, as you'll hear in this episode. Meg came on board with Inside Out at something of an impasse. Pete and the team had the concept of these emotions as characters battling it out within Riley's head, but had yet to figure out a way of translating that idea into a captivating feature film adventure. I spoke to Meg to find out how she, Pete and Josh overcame this hurdle and others like it to craft one of the best loved Pixar movies yet, which is saying something. We discuss how the tragic loss of a colleague at Pixar helped inform the film, how the movie went from a tale about grief to a story about accepting sadness, and why Inside Out is technically a disaster movie. We also touch on the heartbreaking fate of the character Bing Bong in this movie, and get into the chances of a sequel ever seeing the light of day. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demerck. Meg, so good to have you on Script Apart. How are you doing today? I'm good. So thanks for having me. So Joy is mostly at the console today from the sounds of it. Is that fair to say? Well, for for, for this hour, <laughs> I'm pulling Joy forward and uh, remembering how much fun I had working with her uh, in Inside Out. Um, but, you know, life is we're, we have multiple emotions going at all times. Meg, we're so excited to chat about this film, which is six years old now. It still commands so much love and appreciation. What do you put down that response to, the fact that so many people continue to find this film and connect with it? Well, I think I put that down to Pete Docter and the genius of Pete Docter in that, you know, he is he is such an incredible filmmaker in so many ways. But specifically to that question, he has this incredible ability in terms of his concepts and the stories he wants to tell to really drop down into something so specific to him and so brave that he's asking a question about that it actually becomes um, about the human condition. It becomes about all of us. And that's what we want all artists to do. Um, But it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, And I think he found with this movie uh, many, many layers and interesting things to explore that really feels like he's talking about all of us. Mm. Yeah. So we should mention here before we go any further that the screenplay was written with Pete and Josh Cooley. Can you tell us a little bit about what it looked like practically for all three of you to be at work on this one screenplay? Um, Well, animation is very collaborative uh, art form. Um, It's, you know, in terms of writing, it feels more like television in a way you're in a room um, with many, and then you have all the storyboard artists who also have storytelling ability. So they're also throwing in. Um, but in terms of the practical, 
Um, it was Pete and Josh and myself and the co-director, Ronnie Del Carmen, in the room, breaking the story and really delving into our own personal lives. You know, for myself, it's I was an 11 year old girl. I did move uh, to I am a parent like Joy with at the time I had young kids. So um, I think that that is a lot of churn, a lot of emotional, creative churn that's going on and always pushing each other, always pushing to, is that the best thing? Can we go again? Can we do this better? And then eventually it's carded and it's pitched to what we used to call a mini brain trust. That might just be John and Andrew. It might've been whoever was available to come on that day. And then from there, we went to draft. When I came on Inside Out, um, you know, in animation, they board the movie and show it to get notes multiple times, up to seven times over five years. So when I came onto the movie, I believe they were in their second or third screening. So Pete had already done all the research on emotions and chosen his five emotions, uh, the five core. And he had some locations out in the mind that he wanted to go to. So a lot of the kind of, you know, digging up the clay had happened uh, with Josh and himself, and I'm sure storyboard artists and Ronnie And now it was time to kind of, he really, he said to me, people came out of the screening still saying, this is a good idea. And at this point in the process, as we're going to a, I can't believe if it was second or third screening, they should be saying, this is a great movie. Like they hadn't yet gotten a a movie concept and story with all of these pieces. Thematically, he knew what he wanted to talk about, which for a writer working with a director is the most important thing, I think, in terms of that director's ability to articulate the emotional thematic that he or she is digging towards. Um, When I first came on, he had started the movie talking about his own daughter and how when she turned 11, he felt like he lost her, that she before 11, she was goofy and fun and and really kind of very daring and out there and confident. And that when she turned 11, she retreated and got shy and, you know, walked around with her hair in front of her face. And he literally had this question as a father, what happened to my daughter's joy? And that was the original pitch to the brain trust of what he wanted to do. He wanted to go in the mind and find what happened to joy. Um, his first screening, I believe before me, she had had her main relationship with fear, Mm. but Pete realized he didn't know what he wanted to say about fear because ultimately if the main relationship is with fear, what is fear teaching joy that she needs to know? And he didn't ultimately, you know, he said, I remember he said, you know, I was a kid at at this age who was full of fear. You would think I would have something to say. Uh, but he just, as he tried to make that work, it wasn't resonating. He didn't, he wasn't finding a deeper um, thing to say about it. He definitely had found bing bong and that he wanted to talk about the loss of that innocence. Um, but that isn't, wasn't ultimately the, 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 the base core of the story. It was a piece of it. It was an important piece of it, but it wasn't withstanding or standing up to be the core of it. So when I came on, he was just starting to think about sadness Um, if you want to see him think about it, there's a, um, wonderful DVD extra on the movie that Pete is at the point where he's realizing the movie is not working and he's starting to feel a little panic. Like all creative (laughs) artists do, you can win many Academy Awards and still hit this place. I think it's part of creativity. It's part of being an artist when everything falls apart and he's walking, Pete likes to walk, Pete likes to walk when he's stuck Mm -hmm. and he's talking into the camera of what he's thinking. And you're watching him in real time, start to realize maybe this movie should be about sadness. Maybe I have something to say about sadness. And it's pretty spectacular to watch. You know, he's literally is like, well, I think I might get fired because I can't figure this movie out, which is funny because, of <laughs> course, Speed Watcher's never getting fired. But, you know, it just tells you we all have the same fears. Right. And he's and um, he says, you know, what do I what do I miss if I get fired? Well, I'll miss all the fun we had and all my friends and coming to work. And then he realizes what I'm going to really miss is the bonding that we've all had over sadness and over tragedy. They all lost an original founder of Pixar, um, Joe Ramft, in a car accident. They lost together Steve Jobs. And that these things that they went through, the trials and tribulations from the loss of like a death 
or from um, the simple things we all have to go through in artistry of the failures, that those things actually bonded him closer to the people that he was friends with and worked with. So suddenly he's starting to see, well, maybe that's what I want to talk about. And when I came on, he was just starting to talk about that. And, and will that work? And, and um, I was like, I think that's genius. I think that can change the world. And he said, don't ever say that again. <laughs> you know, That's too much pressure. No artist wants that much pressure on something that they're in the middle of creating. Um, so I went up and the very first pitch I heard of the movie, sadness was in the dump, the whole movie. She had gotten lost in the dump and Joy and Bing Bong were having a fun travel log looking for her. And I remember saying to Pete, you know, if the if the thematic emotional thematic of this movie is accept sadness, you're going to have to do that in this movie. You have to accept her onto the journey and we're going to have to push into that and let this let her have a a role to play in this movie and let, let that be from a story construction point of view, the core base relationship of the movie, right? Like there was a lot of discussion about this because when I came in, a lot of people on the, on the, on the movie, I believe uh, like the editor and other people thought the core relationship was with Bing Bong or with Riley, right? Well, it's tricky to make it with Riley because she doesn't know Joy exists. So that's, that's a, she's, and I was like, for me in my brain as a writer, Riley's the prize. She's what we're fighting to save. And so of course she's an essential relationship that we have to earn, but she's not the core relationship at the bottom of what is tracking Joy's evolution. What is helping have her have this catharsis. And certainly Bing Bong is important to that, but he's not there at the end. He's not, he's not something she has to fight for in the climax. She, he's not teaching her this part. So it re- was really about letting sadness come up into the movie, letting her be a, a part of act two, letting her really help joy and be the thing that joy has to realize. Um, and if you look at the f- opening scene of that movie, which was one of the last things to come because they always are, um, there's the whole movie, you know, joy is, Loving Riley and sadness interrupts and joy is kind of like, well, let me just fix what you just did right there because I don't like that. Um, So it's just that was kind of the process of me coming into the movie and um, helping Pete um, see what he was trying to do and help him as a writer now create the structure and the story to help us all dig deeper into that. I'd love to loop back around to a phrase you used a few minutes ago there. Uh, you, it sounds like you had an immediate sense when you came on board the project that this could change the world. I remember one of my overwhelming feelings the first time I saw this movie was, wow, I wish I had this film when I was a kid, because it's hilarious and exciting and tremendously fun as a piece of entertainment. But it's also this incredible tool for understanding the range of emotions constantly whirling around your head as a kid and also kind of well into adult life. So were you conscious, were were all of you conscious as you worked on this film that this could be helpful to people after the credits roll, that it might have a function beyond just entertainment? Well, it certainly entered my mind. I I don't know about Pete, but it certainly entered my mind. I, um, at the time, had young children and we had just gone through a a preschool attachment preschool where you teach emotional intelligence to your kid. The whole theory being there's plenty of times for ABCs and one, two, threes. If they don't have emotional intelligence, they won't be able to learn well anyway. So let's teach them to be clear on their emotions and what they are and how to process them and what their gifts are. Um, So I had had a kind of brining in that soup. And I had seen at this preschool, wonderful, beautiful um, experiences between parents and children and children learning this. And so I understood how powerful this could be. Um, but you also have to put that aside. It's like when I worked on Captain Marvel and was worried, it was thinking about, well, I had this, she has to represent every woman in the whole world. And you're like, <laughs> you can't do that. Like it just <laughs> blocks the creativity and you literally have to kind of look at your, your shoes. You know what I mean? Like, okay, today, does this work as a story? Is this working for Riley? Is this working for joy? Is this working for sadness? Do we have good, a good drive to the story? Like I literally had to be an artist and a mechanic and uh, you know, all the different hats you wear, but really just about telling a good story because I do believe that if you are being brave 
as an artist, as Pete Doctor is, as Josh Cooley is, as um, Ronnie Del Carmen is, as everybody at Pixar is, quite honestly. And you really are pushing into your truth and your experience as a human and things that are hard and things that are challenging, your vulnerability. If you really are pushing into your most vulnerable self, it will reverberate out into the world. People will um, have those cathartic experiences. I mean, that's the oldest idea of storytelling, right? Is catharsis. We, it, when you can truly have a catharsis in the storytelling, it will have impact. And it really did. I mean, when we were doing the Academy and the awards run and, you know, you go to a lot of different parties and, you know, there you get this award, like Pete was going to get an award from LA for, I can't remember why. And he couldn't go. So he said, will you please go? And I went and it was fun. And a woman walked up to me and she said, um, I just want to thank you for your movie because I work for the city of LA and I am a psychiatrist who goes in the night of the trauma. When something has happened to a child that involves law enforcement or the city of L.A., I'm the first responder who goes in to help that child psychologically. And your movie has changed my job because I now have a tool to help that child talk to me about what's happening inside of them. And I remember thinking, who needs an Academy Award? Like, who cares about any of that stuff? Like, that is amazing. Or, you know, I have a special needs child. So I know it's had big impact in the special needs community because children who are nonverbal uh, can speak their emotions by holding up a, a plushie of the emotion or so those things. And the, but honestly, the same thing has happened with The Good Dinosaur, which isn't as a well-known movie. But I've had people call me and say, my son lost his father and he's watched this movie every day for three months because he's it's helping him process. But, like what else as a writer, as an artist, could you ever want you push into your own lava, <laughs> like your own thing that's going to make you feel so vulnerable and, and exposed. Um, and then everybody else gets to have that. You, you're the brave one who does that first. And then everybody else that can therefore benefit from it. Have you always had this attentiveness to emotional well-being, Meg? Because it, it's interesting. It's, it's of course threaded through your work as a screenwriter, but even on your podcast, The Screenwriting Life, which you co-host with Laurie and McKenna, you guys, yes, you discuss the technical side of, of screenwriting and the nuts and bolts of how you construct a screenplay, but you'll often spend like great big chunks of the show discussing the emotional side of writing and the feelings that uh, writing a particular scene can sometimes dislodge in a writer. We, it's what we kind of felt was needed. Um, I think a lot of artists, especially writers, that because I'm a writer, so I know this, feel alone. And you think, well, nobody else doubts and everybody else just understands it and everybody else can just do it. And it's so opposite in reality that art is a cathartic lava lava burn to do. Good one. And I just want everyone to not, Lorian and I really wanted people to not feel alone. And we wanted to support them in that emotionally support them in the path. Yes, we do on the on the podcast also support them with craft or the business of screenwriting, but always in an emotional context. Why do you need to know that and be careful of this and et cetera? So, and all of that also speaks to how you write, right? So I, what I'm hoping is, is that by learning yourself and accepting yourself and wherever you are in your process, that actually makes you a better writer. Mm. And I believe that with the bottom of my heart, that makes you a better writer because you're going to move out of your head, which you're up in your head to avoid all of that emotional, tr- you know, tumult going on. And you're going to accept it. And it doesn't mean it's comfortable, but it's it's there, man. It's there. I had it this week. It's there. <laughs> uh, and then put it into the writing. Let it let it flow through you and out into the writing. Like literally this week, I had a part where I was. I was really getting scared. It didn't work. Oh my gosh, this doesn't work. And I put that uncertainty and fear. I found the scene where the character's feeling that and I just tried to dump it into there, right? So I I always have had this uh, interest in our emotional life. And um, I mean, my grandfather told me when I was in kindergarten, we went into a McDonald's and the girl was really rude to him. And he got very upset and was complaining about this rude girl. And he wanted to talk to the manager. And he said, you looked up at me and said, but what if she's just having a really bad day? (laughs) And I was like, I don't remember this, but he's like, you were this empathetic being that just came into the world, you know? And so I'm trying to use that empathy for the writing to support directors and other visionaries, to support other writers, 
um, because I think the world needs it. I think we need more empathy. I think we need art. I think, you know, the best thing is when you can watch a movie and it begins with a character that you could never in your mind feel connected to. You would maybe even judge um, or their life is so different than yours. And by the end, you are them like you are so connected to them that you and you know them in such an intimate way that that space between us uh, is now gone. Um, and certainly with today's world, it feels like even further apart. My brain is always, you know, thinking, how can we how can we lessen this space between us? Um, but it's just what I'm interested in. So turning to Inside Out, what sort of stage was the script at when you came on board, Meg? And and what were some of the roadblocks that Pete and co were running into that necessitated bringing you in and having you offer a fresh perspective on the story? Well, certainly Josh Cooley and Pete and Ronnie could speak to this better in terms of where they were because they were there before I came. Um, but from what I was told and what I recall, um, again, they had they had found the pieces, a lot of the pieces, but they couldn't find the story. Josh told me that one of the early, earliest um, versions of the story, I don't know if they ever boarded this or not, but one of the very first ones was um, Riley was in a grocery store deciding between what potato chip brand to buy. Now, I can totally hear that pitch. Can you totally hear that pitch? Because here's <laughs> yeah. the pitch. On the outside, nothing is happening. It, it literally, it's about something as banal as which potato chip should I buy? But inside, it's a disaster movie. I can, And intellectually, you're like, oh my God, that's so cool, right? Well, Pixar's process is, well, go try it. Right. Try it. Let's see what happens. You know, it doesn't hold probably for three acts of a major motion picture um, might be a more short film idea. Um, but it, I'm sure it taught them a lot. Um, so they had and there had been other writers before me trying different things. The dinner scene was written by um, a different writer, a Saturday Night Live writer whose name I forgot, which is terrible. Um, again, I didn't meet him or know him, but um uh, he, I believe he also came up with Bing Bong. So there had been all of these creative people creating pieces, but they, again, didn't have this overall, what is the story? Mm. Are we going to use these pieces now to tell a story? Now, as a writer, it's tricky, right? Because I'm coming in and it's not like blue sky because here's the pieces on the board. You need to use these pieces, right? When I did The Good Dinosaur, there were already things built. So you literally, you literally had to use the pieces because people had built those characters already. So. Uh, it, it's it's kind of like a party game in that sense, right? Like, okay, yeah. we're going to go to dream production. It can't just be a go fun and go have fun at dream production. You better go have fun at dream production. But you also have to evolve Joy's character, evolve the relationships, make sure it's somewhere on this disaster movie, road movie, uh, that it feels like it's escalating and how is it shifting and changing and what is, gonna, what is going to um, challenge her. And so what we did was we talked about what the movie could be and this idea of putting sadness in the movie, letting her be uh, one of the main relationships. And then we just sat in the room and started carding. What could it be? Throwing out ideas. Let's put this piece here. And then, of course, some pieces, some great stuff that just didn't make it in the movie because in this new inc incarnation, it just didn't. Uh, service it or fit it or um, but now right now what's fun about animation is so if you're in this room and I've been in TV rooms of course it's verbal it's like a verbal you got all these writers around verbally going right and somebody writing on the board but in animation they're also drawing so Ronnie Del Carmen in my experience was very quiet in these rooms often but he's drawing and um, I remember one day when we were trying to figure out the opening of the movie um, Ronnie was quiet all day long, which part of me sometimes was like, oh no, does he not agree with anything we're saying? Like what's happening? Um, and we'd carted this version. We still could not figure out the opening. And he walked over to Pete and he just started laying out drawings. And it was the opening of the movie. It was the screen with the baby's face and the parents and joy and the ball memory ball coming out and lighting up the room. And it was so beautiful and simple and emotional. You know, now my part as a writer is to say, oh my God, that's amazing. We have to do it. You're a genius. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> like to be the mama bear, like with be like, okay, we're doing this. Okay. How are we going to do this? Like, I still have to put this in the story. It still has to be about this main relationship of sadness. And so then I take it and be like, well, then sadness comes in and she hits the button and joy and blah, 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 blah. And we're moving now into the story. So every, and Josh is just one of the funniest people 
uh, to ever live. And so he is a lot of the humor, especially up in headquarters. And um, so you're taking as a writer, all of these pieces, all of these genius things. And, but my job was to keep finding the container, keep seeing this thing at 30,000 feet and then going in and doing my own personal work. You know, that scene where Riley comes home and talks to her parents and basically says, you want me to be happy, but I'm not. I didn't even realize it when I wrote it, but when I was in the screening, you know, you show these boards, this movie to, you know, 200 people, all in employees of Pixar who all give you notes. And uh, I was sitting there with all of them in the dark and that that scene came up and I was like, oh my God, that's what I wanted to say when I was 11 years old. I wanted to tell my parents, you want me to be happy, but I'm not. Mm-hmm. Now, that was my vulnerability coming up. I didn't even realize it because we were going so fast and we were churning up so much stuff. And I thought, oh my God, I'm getting fired. That's all the first thing I thought when I realized that's me. I was like, oh my God, I'm getting fired. Um, and we showed the screening. And at that point it ended with the hug between the parents and Riley. And then it went to black and uh, there was nobody clapped. Everybody was dead silent. The lights came up and I'm like, I'm really getting fired. I am so getting fired. And I just, am like, I have to get out of here. I'm so, I'm so embarrassed. Oh my God, I got to get out of here. And we're supposed to go up to the brain trust room and now have these giant titans of storytelling, Brad Bird and Andrew Stanton and John Lasseter and Lee Unkrich and take our movie apart. And I was like, I can't, I can't, I can't. Oh my God. And I ran to the bathroom and I was like, I just have to get myself together because this is going to be a bloodbath. It never is, of course, but in your head, it feels like that. Everybody's always very nice. Yeah. And in your head, you're so scared. And I walk in the bathroom and everybody in the bathroom is crying. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, I'm not getting fired. Oh, they're, they were so quiet because we left them in a very emotional spot. We left them wanting to cry about this. And I was like, oh, good. I will go. Yeah. Hooray. I'm not getting fired. Um, so that's when I knew it worked because we emotionally move people. It's funny when I just a couple of years ago, I went out and pitched with Cartoon Saloon, an animation company in Ireland, a, a, new, a movie. And I could, I, I, in that pitch, I made everybody cry by the end. And I was like, I just know how to do this now. <laughs> Again, not because that's like what I want to do. Well, I kind of do, but you no, know, because I'm trying to be honest and emotional and dig that stuff up and you can do it in the room, in a pitch, you can do it. If you're, if you're really on it, if you're really on that vulnerability. You're a professional emotional devastator. What a <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't surprise me to hear that the first scene, that opening scene was one of the trickiest to put together because there are so many moving parts to this film. And I mean, it's, I'm not going to say it's a kid's movie because that's reductive, but it's a movie that you want to be understandable by children. Everybody. Oh my God. There, that movie was so hard. Josh and I literally one day just had our heads on the table because how he was like, this is like writing a movie with four characters in an empty Apple store. They never go to bed. They never go to sleep. They're never exiting. And the rules, oh my God, the rules. When they added personality islands in, I was so mad. I was like, I cannot put one more thing into this movie. And I went to lunch with Mike Jones, a writer on Soul. And I was like, yeah. I, what? I can't do it. I am not doing personality islands. It's too too complex. We already can't explain this movie. And Mike was like, that's a really good idea. You should really do that. And I was like, oh, crap, I have to do it. And so I, re- I remember the day that I pitched to Pete because, you know, there's a there's a need to nobody wants to do voiceover. Right. That's cheating. Don't do voiceover. That's cheating. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, listen, there is so much to explain to people to make this work. It's Amy Poehler. Amy Poehler can do a voiceover in a way that is delightful and we love her and we will love the voiceover. Can't she just tell us what's going on? (laughs) And it works. And she is Amy Poehler and she is a genius and she can do it in a way that you love it. So, and when we did that, we just established the world and moved on. And the other thing we had to establish that was super like, oh my God, how do we do this? Is when Pete pitched me, okay, I, it, maybe sadness is what connects us and that's going to be what this is about. I'm like, okay, here's the trick of that. We have to be in Joy's emotional point of view. We have to believe what she believes. So if she doesn't understand that sadness is valuable and a connector until the end of the movie, that means let's go over to act one. She believes the opposite. 
She believes that sadness is not good for Riley. She believes that sadness should not drive. And God forbid sadness should touch those core memories. Well, that means we have to earn that thesis emotionally in the movie in act one. I have to get every person walking into that theater who is going to know that sadness is good. Sometimes everybody's, you know, had a good cry. I have to convince you of the opposite in act one. Mm -hmm. I have to convince you that sadness is a disaster. And if you really watch act one, we're doing a lot of work to make that happen. There's a whole montage sequence of sadness, ruining stuff, right? She still has to be appealing and cute because she's, um, a character, and we, and I love her, and she was my favorite per, uh, character to write. But wow, that there's a lot of heavy lifting going on in Act One to convince you sadness should not touch those core memories. That we that is a disaster because that is Joy's whole goal, right? Other than get back to headquarters, her emotional goal is sadness cannot drive, cannot touch these core memories, which is her mistake, right? Towards the end of Act Two, because. Even then, she won't let sadness do it, which is why Joy falls down into the dump, right? So, and it's what she does at the end. She literally does the opposite of what she'd do in the first act. She hands those core memories over to sadness. And I'll tell you, even an edit in boards, having seen that scene a million times, when Joy handed those core memories over to sadness at the end, all of us would get a little weak. <laughs> oh, I bet, yeah. Right? But it's because we earned it, right? Like sometimes you get a note and you have to be like, is it the, is it, that we shouldn't do that or we haven't earned it, right? And we did earn that handing the the emotion of handing those core memories over because of all that work in act one of sadness should not touch these. I mean, we literally had a whole day deciding what is the worst thing sadness could do and cry at school one. That's amazing. In the first, like what must be like seven pages, you set it out hilariously, seamlessly. You don't even realize you're taking the exposition in. We we see Riley as a baby. We meet joy, sadness, fear, disgust, and anger. And there's this introduction to how the core memories work. So all that stuff is fed to us so seamlessly. It's also worth mentioning at this point that this is all taking place in the mind of Riley. And Riley is a girl. I'm wondering if it was important that the lead character in this film be a girl, because Women, especially in our culture, have been historically kind of instructed to suppress any emotion that isn't joy or contentment. Was there a decision to make Riley a girl or how did it pan out the uh, sort of creation of the character? I don't know that. She was already a girl when I came on and I don't know if there was a discussion about that. I do know while we were creating it, there were lots of discussions about the fact that she is a girl in terms of like, for example, when I came on, she was a figure skater mm. and figure skating is all about it. It is about athleticism, but often in movies, it's about beautiful, you know, being beautiful in the line and performance. Performance is an important part. Um, and I was just like, <laughs> number one, as a writer, we need to use a lot more emotions than that. Right. Because we've got all these emotions you need to drive. So figure skating, I don't like this is harder. Um and I remember the day that Ronnie Del Cameron was like, what about hockey? And I was like, oh, oh my God, we have to do that because she can be mad. Like, let's let a girl be mad and use her anger in a sport. Oh my God, I love that. It was so great. That's the one time I remember thinking, oh, this is going to be great for a girl character. She's going to play hockey, right? Um, So we had moments like that where as a girl, we were thinking about it. But really, other than that, no, it really was just about her being a person. And of course, she's going through a house move, something you experienced as a kid. Um, She moves with her family from Minnesota to San Francisco which is such a smart story choice because for a movie about emotions, as a kid, nothing lights a fire under you emotionally, like having to leave your friends and move to a new town. There's excitement, there's dread, there's fear, there's anger at your parents. It's just such a time of upheaval. It seems so specific. The way it's depicted on screen is so relatable and understandable. Were you able to kind of bring any level of autobiography of any any of your own experiences to those scenes? Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, what's great about it is it's a a moment of emotional overwhelm, Mm -hmm. right? Um, And you need that. It's a movie about emotion that she, they're all trying to drive. And um, I think what I brought to it, both as a girl who moved, but also as a mother, is um, it was very, very important to me that we have the scene in the movie where um, Riley's in the sleeping bag on the floor and her mom comes in and sits down and says, 
you know, this move has been really hard on your dad with his new business. And thank you so much for being our happy girl and for helping us with this move by being happy. That was so important to me because Number one, it helps you with Joy's character in terms of her need to constantly drive could be very off-putting, right? It could seem arrogant. But in fact, these are her marching orders, right? Her marching orders are coming from the parents. Stay happy. And I do think that happens to a lot of kids. Um, It happens to boys and girls. It happens a lot to girls, just to speak to your earlier question, that people are very uncomfortable if women aren't happy. Um, And so I needed that in the movie to say where this is coming from, where is, where is Joy's need to keep the other emotions quelled coming from? It's coming from here. And you know, that, that scene was on the chopping block a lot, almost every brain trust, because there was a real concern, which made sense that people wouldn't like her, that they wouldn't like mom. And my argument just kept being, but every parent has done this. Every parent, you can't help it. It's weird. You want your kid to be happy. (laughs) You do. And you, if you especially have not dealt with your own emotions and you don't have emotional um, intelligence or at least emotional ability to, to sit in your own anger, disgust, jealousy, whatever, when your kid experiences it, it will trigger you. You won't get any distance. And so you'll tell them to stop doing that, basically. Now you think in your head, well, it's because I need them to be happy and I'm trying to make you happy. But that's not what you should be doing. What you should be doing is reflecting back to them. You're really mad. Wow, you're mad. So that they are like, yeah, I'm mad. Well, you, I'd be mad too. That kid knocked over your block structure. Okay, good preschool. Okay, yeah, I did. And then you wait. Oh, here comes sadness. Right. You, you allow them. You've got to allow those emotions to process through to find out. Yeah, no, you're really sad. And I, and I put this right into the, the wagon going into the dump. Right. That's what sadness is doing. She's just allowing him to be what he is emotionally and process it. Right. Which joy cannot do because mom has told her you've got to be happy. And I literally had this experience. Both my parents are dead. So sorry, mom and dad. But I. Uh, where when I moved, I literally was told, be happy. My, my father's favorite, he's, he'd be so mad I say this, but one of his favorite phrases was, you know, wipe that look off your face, mm-hmm. right? Because the, the anger would come up or the, and he would, he, nope, put a smile on your face. How many times are women told to smile, right? Um, then you're not a full, you're not experiencing your full self, your full humanity. You're, there's, there's gifts in all of those emotions. There's gifts in anger. There's gifts in jealousy. If you're jealous, that's just indicating to you what you want. That's a good thing to know, right? So I, 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 all of that stuff went into the movie. Um, Again, when you're doing it, you're just going and jerk. when I stand back, I can be like, oh, yeah, right. That's <laughs> my parents. I had no, I didn't have that objectivity, right, that intellectual yeah. objectivity when you're doing it. Right. You're just be, trying to be honest. I will tell you a funny story, though, at the premiere of the movie. So I put this scene in where mom says, you know, be happy. And then at the end, Riley comes home and says, you want me to be happy, but I'm not. And my kid at the time was in fourth grade, leans over and goes, I sure know what she's talking about. And I was like, oh, oh, man. oh man, everybody does it. Everybody does it. Yeah. But you mentioned earlier about how, yeah, gosh, it's one thing to have an amazing idea, but to actually be able to build on that, to create a story, something that sustains 90 minutes plus and has meaning and has stakes and takes you on a journey. That's hard to do. But what you ended up doing is you have on Riley's first day at her new school, sadness retroactively turns joyous memories sad. Riley starts to cry in front of her class and it creates a sad core memory. And true to what you were saying about, uh, you know, joy having this worldview of sadness is this thing to be shunted to the side or fixed. She tries to dispose of this sad core memory by using a vacuum tube She accidentally knocks the other core memories loose during a struggle with sadness, deactivating the personality islands. Um, So I guess, first of all, we should talk about these floating islands because they're so visually striking in a film that is all happening in Riley's head. So it must have been hard to come up with a way of telling this story that had physicality and had stakes, but you managed it. 
Can you tell me about yeah the creation of those huge fun visual islands and the memory dump this this chasm in the middle that provides the film with some peril? How did you guys go about creating those islands and giving a physical layout to Riley's mind? Well, when I came on, uh, there were no core memories. We, they didn't ha- have any of that yet, and it, and I remember it was you know we have to create a story here. We have to create something that gives us a plot um, and um, and some stakes, like you said. And um, I remember pitching to Pete this idea of core memories as these special things. And I used the producer Jonas as my example because Jonas loves Disneyland. Man, he loves it. And um, and I was like, you know, it's like the first time Jonas went to Disneyland. You know, it's it's so much of who he is, not just the place, but the the magic and the belief and the you know that this it, it's a core memory. It actually makes up who he is, and uh, that's how they became. But we didn't have these islands to represent those core memories. They just became these balls that were carried around. And mm-hmm. what happens in earlier versions is that they're just balls that you're carrying around by 40 minutes into this movie, right? Because you kind of lose that emotional context with them and the stakes and the disaster of those, of uh, the very first, the very, very first uh, version, the ball, the, mem- the core memories were lost and down into the mind and we had to go, they had to go get them. And I remember Andrew Stanton was like, wouldn't it be better if they were like with them? And the issue was to get them back because then they're with you and, you can work with that as a writer and there's more to do. And I was like, oh my God, you're so smart. Uh, he's also the one that was like, you guys are doing a disaster movie. And I was like, we're doing a disaster movie. That's amazing. <laughs> That's so helpful. Um, so, but the, so the core memories were working, but they weren't fully giving us what we needed in terms of also a ticking clock. What is the ticking clock of the movie? Because the, the memories are with us. What's the thing that is escalating that is making us feel more and more and more and more tense. And when Ronnie came up with the personality islands, as much as I was like, I cannot put one more thing in this movie, uh, Mike Jones was right. And Ronnie was right. And Pete was right. That this is great because it gives you a visualization of the core part of Riley that we can watch dissolve and lose. And now the trick of this is it has to stay emotional, right? They can't just be objects out there floating around. So for example, when the first one crumbles, it's super important. In earlier versions, it crumbled and Joy went, don't worry, I know what to do. Off she goes. And everybody hated her. And it's because you have to have Joy mourn the loss of that part of Riley. And, you know, Pete's so smart to put those flashes of that little goofy girl as the uh, as the island is falling into the dump, those create an emotional sense in the storytelling of loss for the audience and lets Joy feel that loss and feel that vulnerability and feel the overwhelm of, oh, no, what are we going to do? That cannot happen again. That is bad. And then beep, beep. I know what to do. Right. Because Joy's happiness Her optimism is her response to vulnerability. And if you jump the vulnerability part, which is writers you want to do because it makes you feel vulnerable and you just go to the quote unquote fix and solution, you don't like her. She doesn't feel human. She doesn't. That vulnerability part is the connection to joy. So those personality islands became so essential in terms of us staying, knowing what's happening to Riley in real time. So when we lose that island, she shifts and she's not goofy anymore. And you can see it happening on the outside. Because, again, you also have this really challenge that whatever's happening on the outside, inside has to reflect on the outside. Right. Like otherwise, what are the stakes and why are we worried about Riley? Um, So it's a really complicated, almost calculus to all of these pieces having to fit together and reverberate back and forth, sometimes over three different places. Riley on the outside, headquarters down below. Right. It's super high story math, just super high. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, there is an emotion in me called stress that's coming out. Just, just hearing about it. Well, One day I said, I put my head down on the table and the coordinator is walking by outside and she came in and she's like, I'm just going to close the door because nobody should see you doing that. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. But you did find all these things. You found your ticking clock. You found your plot, this idea that you have joy and sadness, this unlikely pair. 
who have to venture back. You found like the purpose for your film. And along the way, they obviously encounter all these obstacles that they have to overcome. We then meet Bing Bong, who is such a special character. I've always wondered about Bing Bong. It's absolutely heartbreaking, his his fate or his his sacrifice, if you will. So we have joy and sadness plummet into the memory dump and they try to use Bing Bong's old wagon rocket to fly to safety, but it's too heavy. Ultimately, Bing Bong chooses to sacrifice himself and we see him fading away into the memory dump. It's true to the idea of imaginary friends. We we ultimately forget them and move on and that's okay. But in, in the process of watching the film, it's one of those moments that really hits you there. What were the, some of the conversations that you had around this plot point and the fate of Bing Bong? Was there ever any um, pushback to that? Like, are you sure you want to sort of essentially kill off this beloved character? Well, there were two things when I came in the movie that stayed. One was the dinner scene, which was actually the proof of concept that you can jump between different people's heads and still keep track of the story. Um, and... Um, you know, Pete's original um, emotional thematic of the movie was the loss of childhood and the sadness that you have over that, especially as a parent. I'm going through it now. My boys are older and I'm looking at pictures of them. They were little for things. It's, it's Christmas and being, oh, my God, where are those boys? You know, you really <laughs> have this sense of loss of those children that they used to be. And so that scene of her in the dump, looking at those memories of, and them kind of dissolving and blowing away. And Bing Bong being a representation of that childhood, that was in the movie when I came. And so, you know, it's one of those things like you have to recognize what's amazing and don't touch it. You know, Ronnie, Ronnie's drawing of that sequence was so amazing. And um, I, I thought for, you know, in terms of what Pete wanted to say, that childhood does go. Um, Bing Bong absolutely needed to go to to. Again, it's loss. Now, what I'm bringing into it is, okay, this is probably one of the only times you're going to see Joy cry. Because why? Well, because now we're bringing this idea of sadness into the movie. So this is Joy finally accepting her own sadness, finally seeing the benefit of sadness. Okay, but it also has to travel to Riley, right? Because we've got multiple story math going on here. So the, the memory she's looking at is the memory that sadness mentioned she liked that joy didn't listen. Why? Because in this memory, she sees the sadness uh, moment bonding her with her parents. Right. Um, so I'm taking as a writer, I was taking this beautiful thing that I did not want to ruin. Um, and then trying to add layers now and, and down into the sadness thematic down into what joy's learning um, so Bing Bong, um, was an invention of Pete's because Pete had an imaginary friend. Um, and, uh, he is an amazing character. Uh, and I pretty much tried just not to mess him up was my, uh, <laughs> experience with Bing Bong. And all of this leads to an ending in which, as we've mentioned, Joy realizes that sadness isn't something to be fixed or made right or shunted out of the way, but it's something that's fundamental to our human experience. It's important to acknowledge our sadness and to let it breathe. This ends up being the takeaway or, you know, the lesson learned, not just by the character of Joy, but also potentially the audience as well. That's so special. Um, it's also quite classic Pixar storytelling. You have a lead character who starts the film with one worldview and they're forced onto a quest and across the course of that quest, they come to understand the world in a whole new way. So in Toy Story, Woody has to get back to Andy's house and in the process, he learns to overcome his insecurities about being replaced. In Finding Nemo, Marlin has to travel across the ocean to find his son, learning along the way that if you love something, you have to let them live their life. Um, here, Joy goes on this journey across Riley's mind and she comes to this realization about the concept of sadness along the way and how healthy it is for sadness to be a part of Riley's life. What, what do you think it is about that very classic story format that's so satisfying to watch and so enduring as a structure? Yeah, I think it's Pixar, but it's also so many great stories, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have a transformative character, and there are different kinds of characters, there's characters who are more claiming their power than they are transforming. Um but transformative characters, I think, do take us on that cathartic journey if we do the transformation with them. If we believe what they believe in Act One and can have that moment of aha with mm -hmm. them at the bottom of Act Two, I think it can be incredibly powerful 
um, to opening people up to their humanity, to ways of looking at the world and themselves. Um, I also think now just in terms of writing for me, um, having worked with the three X structure and transformative characters a lot, both as a producer and as a writer, that I really think that it has stayed with us for so long, all the way back to, you know, the myths that we told around the campfire, um, because I think it is the brain and spirit's way of coming to consciousness. Mm. I think we're all unconscious on some level about some things. We all have blind spots. We're unconscious. Um, and that consciousness shift, that consciousness raising, I think this is a deep fundamental structure of it. And um, so it works and we recognize it. And the more it's in action and behavior, the better, right? Because that's what our reptilian old brains recognize, right? So um, I just think it's ancient and it's about how we are as humans. And so, you know, and I'm all for um, challenging structure and trying new things and telling a story backwards or whatever you want to do. I'm, I'm all for it as a writer, but I usually as a producer, I would, or as a mentor, I'd say, but just tell me why, why does it need to be that? What are, what does that new structure, that new uh, kind of character, why to do what you want to do emotionally, thematically to say to me, whatever you're trying to tell me needs to be told in this way, because, mm -hmm. because why? Right. Um, so I just think that's um, I think that's why it works and has has um, stayed around for so long. The film came out. It was a huge success, such a strong, not only like critical reaction and commercial performance, but just a resonance. It seemed to have and continues to have this staying power and people connect to the film and they talk about it and they talk about the characters and they talk about their takeaways from the film and how it affected their lives. Was there ever talk of a sequel, given that reaction? It's, it's such a perfectly closed arc that I can't see how or why a sequel would need to happen. But then again, I've said that for a ton of great Pixar sequels. That is up to Pixar. That's up to Pete Doctor, right? It's his baby. If he wants to have a sequel to it, however he wants to, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Would you want to be involved if that, if that happened? Well, sure, because I, I love those characters and I love Riley and it would be fun to go spend more time with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, again, it's really, it's Pete Doctor's baby. And you've, you've obviously been super busy since then. And you mentioned at the beginning Captain Marvel, which was another huge project, huge success. That has, uh, you know, an interesting link, knowing that you worked on both projects. It's, it is a film that, yes, it has lots of explosions happening, but it also really keeps its focus trained also on what's going on in this character's head. How are they feeling? Do you see a connection between not just those two movies, but a common thread throughout everything that you write? For sure. I mean, I, that's what I care about in terms of characters. Like we talked about earlier, I care about their emotional experience. I care about them connecting to other people and how they do it. I care about um, them having this emotional uh, conscious raising catharsis. So for sure, that's where I go to build the character. And for me, it always, you know, I, I was lucky enough as a producer to work with Jodie Foster. So I have a very kind of actor director um, um, way of approaching story. And when you, when I worked with Jodi as a producer, the first thing you had to tell her when you wanted to pitch her a project was what she called, what's the big, beautiful idea in here. And she's talking about that emotional, what does this person have to say that it's going to feel revelatory to me, insightful to me. Um, so I'm, you know, those are really hard to articulate. They're hard to find, but the way I find them, uh, is going to character and going to their emotions and their insides and their humanity. So, that will always just be the building blocks off of which I work now on Captain Marvel. Of course, I'm one person of, of many there. I worked with Nicole Perlman, um, who's an amazing human. And I'm so lucky to have worked with her. Um, and we did have a lot of discussions uh, in that realm. Um, so it's just how I, how I do it. And I think every writer can do things differently. Um, I taught a, I taught a seminar once with Sheila Hanrahan Taylor, who's an amazing producer who works in kind of genre movies like, um, you know, the one where the kids, uh, what's that one? Uh, Final Destination, right? So, um, you know, but we did this thing where somebody came up and they pitched and I was on one whiteboard and she was on the other. And we wrote down our questions as the person pitched. 
And her questions started from the outside. What is the poster? What's the tagline? Who's the audience? And went all the way down to what is this about? And I started with what is this about? Why do we care? What is this emotionally? Who is the main character? How are the blah, 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 all the way out to what is the poster? What's the tagline? Blah, 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 right? Because all of that. But we just did it in reverse order. Right. So you, you have to ask all those questions. Right. But really, the tagline of the movie is what this show movie is about. Right. It, 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 it's a it's a it's a it's a beautiful jewel like, you know, you know, going going down, down, down uh, to just the three words that tell you something about what this movie is about and why we should watch it. Right. So, you know, they never hear you scream in space or whatever. Right. Um, so you need both as a writer. And I do have to do both. I have to answer questions like that. Um, not so much at Pixar in terms of audience. You kind of know your audience at Pixar, but when I do other things, um, but I always start, I, I start with those more emotional questions. And Meg, it's always interesting listening to the screenwriting life, hearing you talk about, you, you drop in these kind of cryptic teases about the scripts you're working on and your projects on the go. Can you tell us anything about the things that you have coming up? I know that you uh, yeah, like to keep your cards quite close to your chest from listening to your show, but um, yeah, is there anything you can tell us about what you're working on at the moment and when we can well, next you know, see your work? I have work? to say, on the screenwriting life, I think I say too much. I think I'm like, <laughs> I'm having a terrible day today. Oh my God, writing is hard <laughs> or whatever. Like, I'm very honest about the process. <laughs> you're emotionally honest. <laughs> but I don't tell you the specifics um, because I'm not allowed to. Um, well, I have, I sold, I, I optioned a book with um, my friend, John Morgan, who uh, long ago, who has since passed on um, and uh, two producers, Julian and Bonnie Curtis um, from the 1940s called My Father's Dragon. And we sold it and set it up at Netflix with the Irish um, animation house who are amazing called Cartoon Saloon. I don't know if you remember Secret of the Kells yeah, and Song of yeah. the and they just had Breadwinner last year. That's um, right. Yeah. A movie coming out this year. Um, Wolf. Oh my God. Was it Wolf Walkers? Wolf, Wolf Walker. I was going to say it's Wolf Walker. So and all good. of a sudden, yeah. I was like, I don't know if that's it. Wolf Walkers. Um, uh, the director is Nora, who did um, Nora Tui, who did Breadwinner. Um, we worked for years and years um, just on a treatment and the story and how to adapt that book and then sold it to Netflix and. Um, did scripts and Nora's really made it her own now as she should. Um, and I'm really excited. I've seen the art and it's drop dead gorgeous. Um, I'm so lucky to be working with them. And that comes out in a couple of years. They're moving into animation now, I believe. Um, and then um, I have a, film, a TV show in development um, but you know, development, who knows if they say yes, or no. I, maybe next week I'll be able to say to you, they greenlit my show. Let's <laughs> announce it. Um, but it's a pretty expensive show. So I don't know. We'll see. Mm. Um, but I've had a lot of fun. I've worked, I'm working on that with a friend, Jonathan Fernandez, and it's really, it's really a fun genre for me. It's uh, sci-fi and different. And, um, so, and then I have, I'm working on a project that's top secret that I cannot talk about. And then I have a project coming soon um, that uh, I'm going to go write. That's more of kind of an action movie. So, um, and of course, I'm still in the screen learning life and I'm also working on that passion project. And I have two kids and I'm very busy. <laughs> I like to stay busy. Do you ever sleep? Do you ever have time? <laughs> It doesn't sound like it. <laughs> I guess, I don't know. Sometimes I'm, you know, that Buddhist phrase, busyness is the highest form of laziness. I'm like, well, am I avoiding something? Why do I like to be so busy? I don't, I think that I came to writing late in my life because I did this other career, which mm -hmm. I'm very thankful for. It has informed my writing, but I feel a sense of urgency to tell my stories because, you know, no matter who you are, you have a limited run. Uh, and I don't mean that in terms of the business. I mean that in terms of life. I, I remember once I want really wanted this rewrite job. It was with CBS Films. Who I don't even know if they exist anymore. And um, it was an adaptation. And I wanted it so bad and I didn't get it. And I sat, I had lunch with Jody that day. And she was like, huh, okay, well, you know, given that your life, you're going to have limited projects that you can put your life energy into. Um, is this one of them? Is this where you wanted to put one of those valuable life energy spots? And I was like, oh, no. And she was like, well, then congratulations. <laughs> Uh, and I was like, oh, that's right. That's right. You know, there's reasons to take projects on because you need money or because you want to get established or there's many, many valid reasons, but mm. you also have to do it 
of your heart and um, because you have something to say. Well, I was already very appreciative of you coming on Script Apart and carving out the time. But now I know that you're doing 10 million different projects and running around like a crazy person. I'm even more grateful. So Meg, thanks so much. This has been so much fun. I love this film and um, yeah, so glad you you were able to come. And if anybody wants any more of this, come to the Screenwriting Life and I'm going to tell everybody on my podcast to come listen to yours. (laughs) That's a good trade. Okay, Meg. Well, thanks so much. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Kamil Demek, with music from Stefan Bindley-Taylor. Get in touch. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or you can email us, thescriptapartpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.